This is the Sabbath School lesson for the fourth quarter, 2020. Lesson 6 for October 31 to November 6. More lessons from the Master Teacher. Read by Dr. Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, October 31. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word. As we study your word day by day, we get to see more about you and more about Jesus and how he related to people, how he taught them about you and how we can use some of those methods in our interaction with the people around us. Help us to always teach in love. Help us always to teach with Christ as the centre. And may we always know that you are the one who not only created us, but provided the way of salvation for each person who's listening. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Mark chapter 10 and verse 52. Then Jesus said to him, Go your way, your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus on the road. Let's read that again, Mark 10, verse 52. Then Jesus said to him, Go your way, your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus on the road. Who among us has never been ashamed of himself or herself? Who among us hasn't done things that pain us to think about and that we would recall in horror at the thought of others knowing? Most likely we've all been there, haven't we? Imagine then what it was like to be Adam and Eve after they ate fruit from the forbidden tree, or when Jacob tricked his father into favouring him over his elder brother and then had to run away from his brother's anger. How did he sleep at night? And imagine being the woman caught in adultery, in the very act in John 8 verse 4. David had been there too. And Psalm 32 was his poignant expression and confession of what it had been like. Of course, that's one reason the gospel is universal, and Christ's death was for all humanity. Whatever our differences, surely one thing unites us, our general sinfulness. Hence, true Christian education must be about pointing us to the only solution for our rather dismal state. This week we'll look at our only solution, our Master Teacher. Sunday, November 1, Instead of Hiding Question, read Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 to 11. Why would God have asked Adam, Where are you? Genesis 3, beginning at verse 1. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat of it your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So... When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? Typical stories of the fall depict the fruit as an apple. 
But that's not what the text says. It was simply the fruit of the tree in Genesis 3 verse 3. The kind of fruit doesn't matter. Eating from the tree was forbidden because the tree stood for something. It stood for the temptation to push God aside and to declare, I can be the measure of my own life, I can be God to myself, I have authority over the word of God. And sure enough, when the snake or serpent got out of an eve to eat the tree's fruit, their lives skidded off course. And then, when they sensed God nearby, they tried to hide among the trees of the garden, as it said in verse 8. How strange that God would ask Adam, Where are you? God certainly knew where he was. Perhaps the Lord asked the question to help Adam and Eve realise just what they were doing, hiding, as a result of what they had done. That is, he was helping them see the sad results of their actions. Question, read Romans 5, verses 11 to 19 where Paul many times directly links what Adam did in Eden with what Jesus did on the cross. What should this tell us about how Jesus came to undo what Adam did? Romans 5, beginning at verse 11, And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all sinned, for until the law sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where there is no law, nevertheless death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is a type of him who is to come. But the free gift is not like the offence. For if by the one man's offence many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. And the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned, for the judgment which came from one offence resulted in condemnation, but the free gift which came from many offences resulted in justification. For if by the one man's offence death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as through one man's offence judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation, even so, through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience many will be made righteous. One could argue that the plan of salvation is God's response to Adam and Eve's answer. They were hiding from God in the shame and the guilt of their sin, and God came to rescue them. In our own ways, we too have done the same thing, and Jesus has come to rescue us. Hence the question, where are you, could be asked of us as well. That is, where are you in your sin and guilt in relationship to Jesus and what he has done to rescue you from it? So to finish today, whatever else Christian education entails, why must it entail even emphasize the fact that our natural state is to hide from God and then point us to Jesus as the solution? Monday, November 2, On the Run Question, read Genesis 28, verses 10 to 17. What is the context of this story, and what does it teach us about God's grace for those who, in a sense, are on the run from their sins? Genesis 28, beginning at verse 10. Now, Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran. So he came to a certain place and stayed there all night, because the sun had set. And he took one of the stones of that place and put it at his head, and he lay down in that place to sleep. 
Then he dreamed, and behold, a ladder was set up on the earth, and its top reached to heaven, and there the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it, and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie I will give to you and your descendants. Also your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. You shall spread abroad to the west and the east, to the north and the south, and in you and in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go, and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid, and said, How awesome is this place! This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. In his dealings with the rest of the family, Jacob, with his mother's help, had fallen into cruel deceits, and now he's paying for it. His brother is breathing violent threats against him, and he's become a fugitive, headed toward his uncle's place in Haran. Everything is unsettled and scary. One day, Jacob trudges into the dusk and then the dark. He's in the middle of nowhere with only the sky for a roof. Finding a stone for a pillow, he falls asleep. But sleep's blank unconsciousness is soon interrupted. The famous dream comes, and the ladder or staircase that he sees rests on earth and stretches to heaven. Angels are ascending and descending on it. Then he hears a voice say, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, in verse 13. The voice goes on to repeat promises Jacob is familiar with from the family law. Your offspring will become great. They will be a blessing to all the families of earth. And in verse 15, Know that I am with you, the voice continues, and will keep you wherever you go, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Ellen White wrote of how Paul, much later in Acts of the Apostles, page 512, beholds the ladder of Jacob's vision, representing Christ, who had connected earth with heaven, and finite man with the infinite God. His faith is strengthened as he calls to mind how patriarchs and prophets have relied upon the one who is his support and consolation, and for whom he is giving his life. End of quote. Jacob awakens, and he says to himself, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. Verse 16. What's happened here is awesome. He'll never forget the place, and he gives it a name. Then he vows lifelong loyalty to God. So to finish the day, what can we learn from this story about how God, in Christ, is seeking to reach us despite our sins? Again, why must Christian education keep this principle at the forefront of what it teaches? Tuesday, November 3, Rabbi Jesus Of all the character beginnings in the New Testament, none is more famous than this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John 1.1 1, 1. And John 1 soon takes you to the unforgettable verse, And the Word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. John 1 verse 14 Question Read John chapter 1, verses 1 right through to 14. What are these texts sharing about who Jesus was and what he was doing here? What should this tell us about Jesus as the great example of a teacher? John 1, beginning at verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. 
In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There was a man sent from God, whose name was John. This man came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, that all through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which gives light to every man coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The same God, who spoke to Adam and Eve in the garden, and to Jacob in the middle of nowhere, now shows up as a person. God, says the New Testament, was personified in Jesus. Through Jesus, we can learn about God's will and God's way because Jesus was God. The character goes on to say how John the Baptist was so compelling a preacher that even religious leaders from Jerusalem suspected that he might be someone special. But he was preparing the way for someone greater than himself. Someone astonishingly special was about to appear, and he, John the Baptist, would be unworthy to untie the thong of his sandal in John one twenty seven. The next day he saw Jesus and declared that he was the Son of God. That day, and also the day later, he called Jesus the Lamb of God. Also, two of John the Baptist's followers decide to follow Jesus themselves. And when Jesus asks what they are looking for, they call him Rabbi, which translated means teacher, John one thirty eight. Jesus then is a rabbi, a teacher, but never has there been a human teacher like him, because again, he is God. In other words, God came down to humanity in the form of a human being, and in that form he functioned as a rabbi, a teacher. No wonder Ellen White calls Jesus the greatest teacher the world has ever seen. Signs of the Times, June 10, 1886. After all, this teacher was God. So to finish the day, considering who Jesus was, why does it make sense to learn from him the best ways of teaching spiritual truth? What can we learn from Jesus about why not only what we say is important for teaching, but also what we do? Wednesday, November 4. A woman talks back. Jesus is the master teacher. God's true character shines through in his teachings and also in his life. Thus, one gospel story is all the more remarkable for showing that when someone talks back to Jesus, he still listens. Question, read the story of Jesus' encounter with a Gentile or Canaanite woman from the region of Tyre and Sidon in Matthew 15 and Mark 7. Notice that the men in Jesus' circle are impatient with her and that even Jesus appears to dismiss her. What do you make of the woman's audacity? What does this story teach us about how Jesus himself taught others. Matthew 15 verses 21 to 28. Then Jesus went out from there and departed to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came from that region and cried out to him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon-possessed. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she cries out after us. But he answered and said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then she came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, 
It is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. And she said, Yes, Lord. Yet even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered and said to her, O woman, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. And her daughter was healed that very hour. And then in Mark chapter 7, verse 24 to 30, From there he arose and went to the region of Tyre and Sidon, and he entered a house and wanted no one to know it, but he could not be hidden. For a woman whose young daughter had an unclean spirit heard about him, and she came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek, a Syrophoenician by birth, and she kept asking him to cast the demon out of her daughter. But Jesus said to her, Let the children be filled first, for it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. And she answered and said to him, Yes, Lord, yet even the little dogs under the table eat from the children's crumbs. Then he said to her, For this saying, Go your way. The demon has gone out of your daughter. And when she had come to her house, she found the demon gone out and her daughter lying on the bed. Jesus was near Tyre and Sidon. He had crossed into a place where strangers abounded and ethnic tension bristled. The Greek-speaking city dwellers looked down on Jewish farmers in the countryside and the Jewish farmers looked down on them in return. Not long before, Herod, the puppet governor of Galilee, Jesus' home territory, had executed John the Baptist. But John was a man whose vision Jesus largely shared, and the execution seemed ominous. Jesus had begun to come face to face with the danger of his mission. Feeling the strain, Jesus entered a house, hoping, so Mark says in his account, that no one would know where he was. But, the woman found him. In the culture of that time and place, a woman had no right to assert herself. What is more, this woman belonged to a culture and ethnic group the Jews had little time for, and this put her at a further disadvantage. But the woman's daughter was sick. She wanted help. She persisted in asking for it. Jesus dismissed her. It is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs, he said in Matthew fifteen twenty six. The remark could have hurt her feelings. And then something remarkable happened. She then responded. She was familiar with dogs, unlike the Jews who would not have them as pets. And she said, Yes, Lord. Yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table, Matthew fifteen twenty seven. Her remark makes a difference. It seems compelling, and Jesus heals her child. So to finish the day, let it be to you as you desire, Matthew fifteen twenty eight. How do we understand these words? How do we respond, though, when things do not happen as we desire? Thursday, November 5. A student who gets it. Jesus and his followers had turned toward Jerusalem. As Herod had been concerned about John the Baptist, the authorities, including Herod, were now concerned about Jesus. His followers included the poor and other vulnerable folk, hoping desperately for change. Jesus wanted above all things to bring hope to the world. But he was sure by now that those with the most power and privilege were going to do what they could to nullify that mission. They did not want him to succeed. As for the inner circle of Jesus' students, the twelve disciples, they seemed eager to be on Jesus' side. But at the same time, they seemed baffled or blind. For example, in Mark eight thirty-one to 33 the master teacher is challenging his students to see things hard for them to see. That is, in many ways, they were spiritually blind to what really mattered. We read that in Mark chapter 8, 
verses 31 to 33. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed, and after three days rise again. He spoke this word openly. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when he had turned around and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter, saying, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of man. And here's what really mattered. Verse 37. Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? All this is background for Jesus' encounter with someone who does see. Question. Read the story of Jesus and the healing of Bartimaeus, a blind beggar in Mark 10. Notice the great mercy Jesus shows. Now consider how the blind man's desire to see leads to his decision to follow Jesus on the way or road to Jerusalem. Do you think Mark may be drawing a contrast between Bartimaeus and the other disciples? How does this story shed light on what it means for you to be responsive to the Master Teacher? Mark 10, beginning at verse 46. Now they came to Jericho. As he went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great multitude, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the road begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Then many warned him to be quiet, but he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. So Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. Then they called the blind man, saying to him, Be of good cheer, rise, he is calling you. And throwing aside his garment, he rose and came to Jesus. So Jesus answered and said to him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, Rabboni, that I may receive my sight. Then Jesus said to him, Go your way, your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus on the road. Bartimaeus had wanted to see the curl in a baby's hair and the colour of wheat in harvest. But seeing includes more than just what's physical only. This story, in other words, is about seeing spiritually. It's about getting it, about catching on to what the master teacher is truly about. Physical sight is one thing. It's an important thing, and Jesus knows it. But Jesus also knows that every person's deepest wish is for a new and better life. And so to finish today, read Hebrews five, twelve to 14 What is this teaching us about true education? Hebrews 5, beginning at verse 12. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you, again the first principles of the oracles of God, and you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe, but solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern good and evil. Friday, November 6. Ellen White teaches us in her book Steps to Christ, page 58, among other things, that when we truly respond to the Master Teacher, we long to bear His image, breathe His Spirit, do His will, and please Him in all things. In the company of Jesus Christ, duty, she says, becomes a delight in page 59. Now, from the Bible, consult Matthew 5-7 to in your own time. Here is the Sermon on the Mount, one of the great summaries of what the Master Teacher wanted his students to know, and the keynote of the kingdom he came to establish. And that brings us to our four discussion questions for this week. 
1. As God addressed Adam and Eve, and also Jacob, so Jesus addresses us. He connects with our deep longings and he startles us, as he did with Bartimaeus, into reconsidering who we are and where we are going. In this light, think about how we teach the Bible to our children and to one another. What is the difference between mediocre Bible teaching and the compelling kind that really makes a difference in people's lives? 2. Is the question of where you are on life's journey purely personal, or might it be helpful to discuss this with people you trust? How does the idea of the church as the body of Christ in 1 Corinthians 12.27 suggest that conversation with others can be one way of getting in touch with what Christ wants you to know? 3. We learned on Thursday that as soon as Bartimaeus could see, as soon as he was rescued from his physical and spiritual blindness, he followed Jesus on the road to Jerusalem. On this road, he heard every day the Master teacher's wisdom. Now, we may assume, he wanted to bear Jesus' image, breathe his spirit, do his will. Why would someone take delight, as Steps to Christ puts it, in following a standard as high as the one Jesus upheld in the Sermon on the Mount? And question four. Dwell more on the question at the end of Thursday's study, how do we learn to discern between good and evil? How do we define what is good and what is evil? And why is what we do with that knowledge perhaps even more important than having that knowledge itself? Inside Story Our mission story this week is titled Miracle on an Indian Road and it's by Daisy Jong. The other day my husband and I travelled to the city to buy materials for the chapel that we are constructing in a village in India. We also needed supplies for the student volunteers who were helping us share the gospel in the area. My husband bought electrical equipment for the construction project and I found 15 guitars for the volunteers and 100 notebooks for their classes. It was 9pm when we started the three-hour drive back to the village. As my husband drove, we chatted and listened to music. About half an hour before reaching home, a strange sound startled us. da 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 bang The sound was quite loud. We were not sure what had happened. My husband stopped the car and stepped outside to investigate. A tyre was flat. When we saw the flat tyre, we looked at each other and laughed loudly for some time. How many times have we had a flat tyre like this? My husband asked. Well, let me count, I said. If I include the bicycle, then it must have happened many, many times. Our life is really not boring, darling. We didn't have a spare tyre. Stranded in the countryside in the middle of the night, we called Pastor Abishek for help. Music played softly in the disabled car as my husband calmly sat in the driver's seat waiting for the pastor. The car didn't have a working air conditioner and we soon began to sweat. I chased a mosquito around the car. Suddenly lightning flashed across the dark sky and thunder rolled. Raindrops splattered on the windows. Honey, I said, this situation is quite unfortunate, but funny. Life isn't boring here in India. After some time, Pastor Abishak arrived to pick us up. We moved the 15 guitars, 100 notebooks and electrical equipment into his small truck. As we drove toward home, the pastor surprised me. When you called me, my cell phone was on silent mode, he said. Even the vibration function was turned off so I could sleep. I don't know how it happened that I woke up at midnight and looked at my phone at the very moment you called. I normally sleep soundly the whole night through. Our hearts trembled as he spoke. God had woken him in the deep of night and impressed him to check his phone. God knew that two of his children were longing for home. By now it was raining heavily. Lightning illuminated the road and thunder roared. 
but we were happy because we were going home. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Angel Abishek. Names have been changed to protect the work of volunteers serving in a sensitive part of the world. This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind and Hearing Impaired, Christian Record Services for the Blind, the Sabbath School Department and Hope Channel. You can also listen on the official Sabbath School 4 app and the Apple iTunes app, Sabbath School with Percy Harold. Remember, God is always faithful.